Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And uh, Merry Christmas Eve. I think that's probably due, right? It is very, very, very good to be back with you guys today. And contrary to popular belief, I did not meet with the Pope. <laughs> but, what's that? I was too busy. He, he called me, you know, but, but yeah, I did have a great opportunity to actually visit Rome, which is where Vatican City is and stuff. Drove by it. Absolutely incredible. But um, I was also blessed with an opportunity to go to the Colosseum. And for that thing being built 2,000 years ago, it's ginormous. I mean, it's absolutely mind-blowing. Probably the most amazing place that I've ever personally been. But standing in there and realizing that, that this is a place that the emperor of Rome literally tortured and murdered Christians on a consistent basis was just, I mean, that's powerful. Whenever you think about that, um, and then just down the road from there is the place where they believe is the prison that Paul was in. And I got to go down inside there, like actually stand in there. It's teeny tiny. It's very dark, very cold, very wet. And just the small amount of time that I was in there, I was like, this is uncomfortable, you know? But I wasn't even chained to the wall like he was, you know? Um, I just thought the way that Christians have been persecuted over these, these thousand, couple thousand years is just, it's wild, you know? And we, I think we do take it for granted. We don't mean to, I don't think, you know? We just don't realize the depth of destruction that's been done to Christians and Christianity over the years. But whenever I got back, Brittany and I got to really start talking about what we feel really is the, the true meaning of Christmas and what God has done to reconcile us to himself. Really, if you think about it, the way that he, he sent his son to this earth, you know, a lot of people say, well, how can a loving father do something like that? Well, that loving father is our loving father. Not just Jesus' loving father. You know, he was literally making a way where there was no way. He was making that way. And so, talking about all of that, we wanted to basically title this message reconciliation. Um, I know that doesn't necessarily sound like a typical Christmas theme, but it really ultimately is. Mm -hmm. So maybe why don't you um, kind of lean into some of the things that you were thinking about? Well, we, you know, when you think about reconcile and what that means, it's, it's, taking what was and making it right, making it whole, and reconciling us to himself, which is, was the ultimate plan for Jesus' birth and his life. You know, it was God's intentions from the beginning of time. He never intended for us to be separated from him. And so you see it all throughout Scripture. There's foreshadowing in the Old Testament and uh, one story, which Nathan is going to talk a little bit about, is the story of Ruth and Boaz in Ruth chapter 4. And, and this example is an example of redemption and reconciliation. Jesus was the ultimate kinsman redeemer, and this foreshadows that. How about you do Ruth? I'll do marriage. <laughs> He's changing up on me here. Okay. <laughs> well, so with the story of Ruth and Boaz, for time's sake, I'm not going to read the whole story, but 
Basically, actually, I'm not, not going to do that. Um, basically, Ruth was a widow. Her husband had died, and um, her mother-in-law's husband had died. If you don't know the story, Naomi had two sons, and Ruth was Naomi's daughter-in-law. And Ruth chose to follow Naomi back to her homeland. The ch- you know, she chose to choose the children of Israel's God and forsake her own gods. And she chose that even though there, there was no promise of a life for her. You know, back then, women were property. I mean, it sounds terrible, but that's kind of how women were viewed. And they, they could do nothing without a man. They even had no way of providing for themselves. But she chose to follow Naomi because she, I believe she had faith in God. And when they get back um, to, it was to Jerusalem, right? I don't have my Bible open. But when they go back to Israel, she, um, there's a man named Boaz, and it was Bethlehem. And he was, by history's terms, the kinsman redeemer for that family. So the way that it was back then is if, if a woman's husband passed away before she bore children, someone else in the family would marry the woman, typically the brother. And I'm thankful it's not like that today. <laughs> I mean, n- nothing against his brother, but it's just weird to me. But, <laughs> um, well, his brother was also no longer alive. And so then it just moves down the family line. And... Um, so that I don't take 20 minutes to tell the story. (laughs) Basically, Boaz, Ruth goes and asks Boaz, you know, reminds him, you're the redeemer for for our family. And, And Boaz was a faithful man of God. And he was blessed by the fact that Ruth would even come to him, you know, because the Bible talks about how he was an older man and she was younger and she could have gone for a a young, cute guy, you know. But she didn't. And there was one more man ahead of him that would be the one to to step in. And he offered it to him. But that man was not willing because he would have to give up his children's inheritance because the way that it worked is... She, he would take Ruth as his wife, and the son that she bore would be in her husband's, her deceased husband's name. And part of the inheritance would go to that son. So this man wanted to do it until he found out he would have to marry Ruth. And he said, well, that's going to take from my own children's inheritance. But Boaz was willing to pay the sacrifice. And he married Ruth, and the Bible says that he was her kinsman redeemer. And she had a son. And Jesus actually came through that lineage. So what I love about that story is the sacrifice that Boaz made. Because it's a foreshadowing of what Jesus was willing to give up. He left heaven, gave up perfection, gave up, I mean, it's, we can't wrap our minds around it. Like you hear it and it, so, it sounds like a fairy tale, you know? No pain, no sorrow, no suffering, not even feeling a want or a need for something. It's unfathomable to us, but it is a reality. And he left that to come, to choose suffering to redeem us. That is the story of Christmas. And he reconciled us to himself through that. You're up. You know, we were thinking about maybe doing like tag your it. Yeah. You know, pass she gets the to baton. talk. Yeah, pass the, you know, whatever. <laughs> because I'm quite a talker, I think, is probably why she threw that out there. She's like, you know, maybe we should tag each other in. But <laughs> we figured, well, I bet we can probably roll through this without tagging. But so this, like Brittany laid that out, Jesus truly is our kinsman redeemer. Just like, just like Boaz was to uh, Ruth and Naomi. Um, their family, he had to step in. Jesus had to step in for us. 
that kinsman redeemer is like family redeemer, redeeming us back into the family. And um, there's a scripture in Second Corinthians five eighteen through 19, and it says, And all of this is a gift from God, who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So just like Jesus did with us, just like God the Father did by sending his Son to the earth to reconcile us, he says that now that's our task. Our job now is to help reconcile people because if we don't tell people that they can be reconciled to God through Christ Jesus, how are they going to know? They're certainly not going to know through the media that we have today. They're not going to know through, you know, uh, through school. Most definitely not through school. They're not going to find out by anybody else unless we are willing to reconcile them, to help show them. Yeah. Okay, we can help redeem them, and that's that's um, a big part of our job too. It's God's design. Yep, yeah. and that's what is so amazing about creation is God created creation to be a mirror image of himself. I mean, in Genesis, he says, let us make them in our image. And so every structure he created is an example of him. And that's what we were, you know, realizing as we were thinking about it. Like, he calls us, he, and, it, and it's not like it's some task we have to do. It's a privilege. He's saying, come along with me. You get to be a part of this. I redeemed you. I saved you. I gave you a life when you had none. Now you get to help me give life to others and show others. And every structure in his word is an example of Jesus and his relationship with us. And so we're going to touch just a little bit on each of these marriage on parent-child relationships, on friendships, on relationships of authority, like people in authority, supervisor and employee, uh, the body of Christ. All of these things are examples of God reconciling us to himself. And he reconciled us so that we can be a light in the world and show people what that looks like, you know? And... And it's something I think that we that unfortunately has not become a priority anymore, right. you know, because if it was, the world would want Jesus a lot more than they do. Right. But instead, they see us as believers grumbling and complaining and slandering and backbiting and all of those things. And I'm not trying to be condemning, but this is a challenge for us to to say. Do these areas of my life look like Jesus? Do they look like what God did for me through Jesus? Yeah, a, a statement that Brittany made um, while we were talking about this is she said that we are partners in reconciliation. So whenever we're up here and we're talking about how we get to be part of that and, and it is a task that God has given us to do, none of us should be in fear of it, like I get it. Like some people don't like to go and and talk in public and and go meet perfect strangers and and talk to them about stuff, especially something that that we might get ridiculed about or something. But remember that God says that we can do all things when Christ gives us the strength. And if He's called you to be a reconciler, we get to partner with Him in reconciliation. Then we can trust that He's got us. He's going to hold us up. He's going to help lead us and guide us and direct us through those things. And so um, in Ephesians 5, 22 through 23, Brittany said that we were going to kind of bring out different examples of reconciliation and relationships that we get to be in and how that's supposed to represent Christ's relationship with us. And um, so I'm going to point some of this out in marriage. It says in Ephesians 5, 22 through 23, For wives, this means submit to your husbands as the Lord, for a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. Christ is the Savior of the church. And as the church submits to Christ, 
so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, well, before I go too much farther on that, that can be taken way out of context, can it? It gets taken out of context yeah, a lot, right? But what this is truly saying is, is, even though it says for wives this means submit to your husbands, as the church submits to Christ, it says as the church submits to Christ. So husbands for us, we've got to be fulfilling that role if we expect them to submit to us the, the way that the church submits to Christ, right? Because Christ is, is perfect and sinless. So we have to do our very best to be that for them. Do you want to add to that before I go on? No. Okay. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave himself, his life, up for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. You can just repeat it. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot, wrinkle, or any blemish. So guys... If you ever try to use that first scripture as wives submit to your husbands and you aren't doing this part, you aren't laying yourself down for her just like Christ laid himself down for the church, then you're wrong. You're 100% wrong and you can't hold that against her. Right? But, and I would like to add too, um, I mean, we're all called to be faithful to the Lord. Yes. And so for the wives... That goes for us, too. You know, we can't use that as an excuse. Well, my husband isn't loving me like Christ loves the church, so I don't have to submit or honor to him. And that word submission is not, like, the Bible talks about, it's not the husband lording over the wife. Like, I'm in charge of you, you know. It's a, it's a place of trust. I can submit to him because I trust and know that he has my best interest in mind. And the times in our marriage when he didn't have my best interest in mind, I had to choose to trust and submit to the Lord. And out of my trust for the Lord, I chose to submit to him. So it's not about when people are deserving you know, because we all fall short, and there are all going to be times where, as husbands, you might not be deserving of your wife's respect. There's going to be times where wives were not deserving of our husband's love. But it's about commitment and choice. Yeah. That's huge. I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up. Because with this being the Christmas story about reconciliation, you know, it said, while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, the Father sent Jesus into this world to purify us. So if you're looking at it in a husband and wife relationship, guys, maybe even if your wife isn't in that place, it's up to us to seek the help from the Lord and lead and guide the way that he's called us to, to help bring them. Because it says that Jesus, Jesus cleansed us. Through God's word, Jesus is the one that, that purified us and, and presented us to himself as a pure and spotless bride, right? Mm -hmm. So there's so much that goes into that. I wish that we had a little more time to go on that, but we don't. It says, for a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ, as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and joins to his wife, and the two are united into one. And then it goes on to say, which I just love this part, it says, this is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. You know, it's, it's a mystery how God knits us together. It's unexplainable. And, you know, we joke around about it like, you know, and this is more of a earthly, natural thing, but how you might finish your spouse's sentences. Or you know when you've been married for a long time, you know what they need before they vocalize it, you know. It's, it's a knitting together. It's, it's like just such a close, tight relationship. And it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. We're supposed to be so knitted to him. He made the way for us to be. You know, Brittany, Brittany said 
that you can finish each other's sentences and maybe uh, even after time you know what they need before they even vocalize it. You know, you can only get to that point if you truly are putting them before your own selfish needs, wants, and desires. That's the only way that you're going to know what they need before they need it, right? Before they even ask for it, is if it's important enough to you to put them first. And if we're doing this husband and wife relationship right, it is going to mirror God's relationship with us. And, and that's going to cause the people in the world to be able to look at us and go, wow, that's different, you know? Because the world is, is full of selfish people. Right. But if I'm putting her before myself, my needs, wants, and desires, she's going to do the same for me. And that's what's really going to stand out. Yeah. You know, I'm loving her that much, and she's loving me that much. Exactly. And, you know, if you think about Jesus and the body of Christ, love, him loving us as his children, is not him laying down and letting us run amok. Right. He has, God is a God of order, and he has boundaries. And so, that's another depiction of our relationship with him in marriage. It's not being a doormat, no. you know. It's not, um, it's not a, a selfish fleshly thing of like, I'm going to give you your way all the time. Boundaries are, is an example of love. You know, I heard this example one time, which I love. If you think about like, you know, winding roads on a mountain. If you've ever been to Colorado and sometimes you're driving on those small, tiny roads and you're going around the mountain, and, and you know, even when we go to Branson, there's some areas where I can look down, and it's like, ooh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's rails, there's safeguards. Those safeguards aren't there to uh, take away from you, <laughs> you know, like, I'm going to ruin it for you and put a safeguard up. No, those rails are there to protect you. And so the Lord's boundaries, they're safeguards. They're there to protect us because he knows what awaits <laughs> on the other side of the cliff. And so um, I just feel like, you know, we could talk about marriage all day and we got to move on, but I feel like that's an important part of it, you know, um, that having boundaries. And love does not mean being a doormat. Love does not mean trampling on people for your own selfishness. Like, it's, it has to be from a place of unselfishness, which we get that power to do that through the Holy Spirit. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. So one of my big passionate things to talk about is marriage because God has redeemed us through so much. You know, and most of you know, you've heard me kind of talk about um, some of the things in our past before and how really I... I uh, self-sabotaged and destroyed our marriage, but God brought us back together. He redeemed us, and, um, and man, I, I'm just so thankful to him. I'm so thankful to her for being willing to uh, allow God to heal and cause that reconciliation, you know? But um, the next thing that we wanted to talk about was how the parent-child relationship also shows that reconciliation and how God treats us as his children, and how that looks um, in accordance with reconciliation from God to us as well. I wanted Brittany to talk about that because she's a way better parent than I am. It's not true. We're just different. But I, you know, there's so many examples in the Bible of parent-children relationships. Some are what not to do, <laughs> you know. Um, and But the one that I just could not not talk about is the story of the prodigal son. And it's a popular one. But it's the ultimate example of a loving, merciful parent. You know, this kid is a spoiled little brat, <laughs> throws his little temper tantrum, wants all his inheritance. And his father could have been like, no, you're not getting that right now. You, you aren't ready. You aren't responsible. You don't deserve this right now. But he gave anyway, even though I guarantee you that dad knew this ain't going to go well. <laughs> and it didn't. <laughs> you know, he went and partied it up and blew all his money and had no, you know, had felt like he had no place to go and was eating with the pigs on the streets. But he decided to go back to his father. 
and his father rejoiced when he saw him coming. That is mercy. He gave that son what that son did not deserve. You know, and that, as parents, sometimes, sometimes that is so hard to do. You know, because you want to, because you know what that takes? That takes this. That takes letting go. Not being in control. When we are gripped onto something trying to control it, we're not trusting the Lord. Because we're trying to make it happen. We're trying to prevent things. We're trying to control what the future holds. And and the prodigal son with the father, he, he let go. And I guarantee you that dad was praying his guts out while his son was gone. We don't know how long he was gone. But when he came back, he embraced his son. And what I love, and he put a robe on him. And he put a ring on him. And he threw a party for him. Like, he could have been like, uh, you blew your inheritance. You're out of luck, buddy. You know? But he didn't. He gave him what he didn't deserve. And as parents, what that teaches me is that we should be showing our children who they are, not how they're acting and behaving. With our words and actions, we should be showing our children who they are, who we know they are, who God created them to be, not how they're acting and behaving. And that means we're not shaming them. I'll admit, I struggle with that whole thing of like, and I think some of it was in my own upbringing, where uh, I deal with the struggle to, to guilt my kids into doing what I want, you know? Like, and I, I really have to ask the Lord to help me keep that in check. Because when has condemnation ever brought success? When has accusing ever brought success? And the story that I wanted to share is of my daughter, Trinity, and I asked her if I could share it, and she said yes. Um, Because it was a moment where we had a choice. We had a choice to shame our daughter, or we had a choice to speak life. And we have these moments in life with our children, and we want to look like Jesus. We want to look like Jesus. And the story is uh, when Trinity, she was 17 at the time, came to us to tell us that she was pregnant. And uh, it was at midnight (laughs) after we had been on an anniversary trip. We were exhausted. (laughs) And she came into our room and told us she wanted to talk to us. We had just gotten home. and, um, And she told us, she said, I'm pregnant. And at first, I actually laughed because I thought she was joking. Because my girls have done that. I have three teenage daughters. So they think it's funny to just randomly be like, Mom, guess what? I'm pregnant, you know? And so I was like, ha, 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 funny, you know? And (laughs) and she was like, no, I'm pregnant. Really? And and I, you know, I was shocked. (laughs) And I was standing there. And I just felt the Lord say, wait. And I just took a breath, and I just said, Lord, help me to say what you want me to say. And later, I realized, well, I didn't say anything negative. I literally walked up to her, and I wrapped my arms around her, and I said, we love you. And guess what the Bible says about children? It says that they are a gift from God, that they are a reward to those who have them. The Bible doesn't say if everything's done exactly how he would hope that it would be done, then they're a reward. It doesn't say that. It says they are a reward. And I said, this baby is going to be a gift to our family. And I just, and she broke down crying because she you know, she was dealing with the shame and guilt and the weight of, like, what are people going to say about me, you know. And we got to take the opportunity to show her Jesus in that moment. We could have done it different. But in that millisecond of a moment, we gave, we had the choice to give the reins to the enemy and let him have his way or to give the reins to Jesus and let him have his way. 
And that is the example he wants us to be to our children. We're not going to be perfect parents. You're, we're not going to get it right all the time. If, you've, if your children are grown, you already know. You know more than me. <laughs> so if you want to help me out, I'll take all the advice I can get. But, you know, we're, we're going to mess up. But we get to be humble and admit that. That's another thing. Humility leads the way to honor. And Jesus was humble. And so we get to be that with our children. And so I just, later on with that, with that moment, in the moment it was just like the Holy Spirit taking control. But later on the Lord showed me that. He said, you have those little moments all the time in your life with your children, with your spouse, with your boss, at the checkout at Quick Trip when you're in a rush and you've already had a flat tire and you're ticked at the world. We have those moments to either be an example of Jesus' reconciliation or let the enemy in to do things his way, which always brings destruction. And guys, if, if y'all are parents out there and I know that with me, Satan oftentimes tries to bring back to my memory the times where I failed. I didn't do this. I didn't seize the moment and treat my children and respond to my children the way that God has responded to me. You know, I've responded out of my flesh, out of my uh, natural instinct, out of my anger, out of my frustration, whatever it is, you know. But we can't focus on the past. We can focus on the future, right? So no matter where you are in life as far as, as parents or, or maybe you don't have children, maybe you are uh, the child to your parents, you know, let's do everything that we can to exemplify how God wants us to respond in each of those situations. Whenever we move on to friendships, one of the most interesting stories about friendships in the Bible is the story about King David with Saul's son, Jonathan. Well, before David was king and his, his predecessor, Saul, was king, Saul was out literally to try to kill David. But Saul also had this son named Jonathan. And man, as soon as, as Jonathan and David met, they just became great friends. We've got Jonathan here, who's heir to the throne. He would be, he would succeed Saul to the throne. Yet he humbled himself in front of David because he knew that God put this authority on David. He knew it. And he gave his personal belongings to, to David as well. They became such great friends, but David as well treated him with such honor and dignity and respect, even though his dad was trying to kill him, he still treated him with honor, dignity, and respect. And not even so much the, the friendship between... Are you going to talk about Saul and, and David at all? No. Okay. So I'm going to step into that for just a second, too. Well, I'm going to talk about it with authority, but... Okay. Well, then I won't step into it. I'll just stick with Saul Jonathan and David. Jonathan and David. So... Um, one of the amazing things about that relationship is the way they both humbled themselves. You know, the Word says that God gives grace to the, to the humble, but He opposes the proud. Both of them had every right to be proud and to allow, well, they had every opportunity to be proud, you know, as Jonathan knows that he's next in line to the throne. David knows that he's been anointed to actually be king. So they both... In, in worldly sense, would have just been battling one another. But they both loved each other so much and, and put each other's needs before themselves even. You know? And Jonathan even went so far as to let David know whenever Saul was actually trying to kill him. And, and, and Jonathan didn't want to believe it, right? He's like, no, surely my dad's not going to kill David until Saul literally tries to throw a spear at his son at dinner and tries to kill his own son because he's standing up for David. That's, that's, that could cause some friction, right, in a relationship. That could cause some significant friction. But they loved each other so much that they were always putting each other's needs before their own, even though they were both, like, could have been in competition for the throne. Right. To the point to where, after Jonathan had passed away, 
David sought out his son to honor him. He sought him out to honor him and said, you'll eat at the king's table for the rest of your life. I'll provide for you. I'll take care of you. And so even friendship, God designed to point back to him, to point back to Jesus. So we get to show the world what this this is like. And I think it's important for all ages. I think about the young kids and the teenagers, you know, when you don't see this example at school, you see everybody trying to trample everybody else to get ahead, you know? I'm going to tear you down so that I look better. It's all about competition, and I'm going to beat you. I'm going to be better than you. I'm going to be cuter than you. I'm going to have, you know, the coolest girlfriend or boyfriend or, you know, success, success, competition, power, exaltation, you know? And so as teenagers and kids, you guys have the example, or you have the opportunity to show the world different. It's not popular, but it's that kindness. It's that humility. It's where you're looking out for others' interest above your own. And, and we get that opportunity, which I love. And even, even outside of friendships, you know, you have the opportunity to show God's reconciliation in friendships, but you also have it with, with absolute strangers. And that's, that's something that we have to understand, that we've got that responsibility as well. If you look at the Good Samaritan, right? The, um, we have this person that's literally beat down on the side of the road. They've been robbed from everything. All their clothes stolen even. That'd be pretty humiliating, right? But then here comes the Samaritan that everybody else looks down on. And that person showed the love of Christ, showed what it truly was to be a friend. Who, he was the, this outstanding example for us to be able to follow, to show truly how God wants us to love one another, to love everybody, you know? Think about the impact that that made on that person's life that was robbed and beat and everything. I bet, and Jesus doesn't necessarily say it in this parable, but I bet that that person probably looked way down on Samaritans, you know? Probably had very poor, um, very poor opinions of Samaritans because of the lifestyle. I can't get into all the history of that right now, but the, the Jews and the, and the Samaritans, they really didn't get along very well at all. But God used that one person that's, that's, that's just totally um, unexpecting, you know, to actually show His love and His mercy and His grace. He wants us to show His love and His mercy and His grace, maybe even to people that oftentimes we don't, we wouldn't normally get along with, or maybe we've got some prejudice or bias against them or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. We've got to put all that stuff aside in order to be able to show the love of Christ in a true and impactful manner. That's right. And so like he was saying, the relationship with Saul and David. So this is a perfect example of authority, relationships where people are in authority, you know, like a supervisor and an employee or or just, you know, anybody that has a place of authority. I think about law enforcement and their authority. I think about our government, our president. That's a hard one, right? Sometimes, sometimes we don't like who... We, sometimes we don't care for the people that are in authority over us. But does that mean that we get to slander them and tear them down and disrespect them? That's not, that's not the example that God gives us in the Word. You know, like with Saul and David, David refused to dishonor Saul. Saul treated David like trash, I mean, it says David was running for his life and hiding in caves, living like an animal. David had every right to kill Saul, and he had opportunity to kill him. And all of his group, his friends and his supporters, they wanted him to kill him. They said, and they even gave, they even said that it was God giving him the opportunity. They said, look, God's given Saul into your hands for you to kill God did this. How many times do we have people around us saying that God's the one giving us an opportunity? Whew, we better make sure (laughs) because sometimes it's the enemy sneaking his way in there. 
And David refused to dishonor Saul because he recognized that God had placed Saul in that position of authority. Nothing, God doesn't miss anything. He knows who the presidents are and who the kings are and who the legislation is and who the judges are and who your boss is. He knows. And he's allowed them to be in that position. And we're called to honor them, not because they're worthy of it. We're called to honor them because that's what Jesus would do. He would honor them. We don't have to agree. We don't have to, and we most certainly don't have to defy God's word. We see examples of that, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, we're not called to dishonor God's word, to honor authority. But we should watch our words. I mean, I've gotten to where I can't stand social media. I hardly ever get on there. And, it's, and it stinks because it can be such an awesome tool for the Lord, too. And I have a page that I try to minister through and do videos through. But it is so hard to get on there. I just, like, I'm not clicking on comments because it crushes me to watch Christians just lose their minds over opinion and dishonor the Lord. Like, we are his examples. You know, we're supposed to, the Bible talks about us being a sweet-smelling aroma. It's like, this stinks. <laughs> it is not sweet. And so, so that is just a beautiful example of reconciliation with Saul and David. David refused to come against Saul. He knew God will do that when he's ready to do it. And he kept his eyes on Jesus, and God did it. God is just. He will take care of things. There's another example that I wanted to uh, give. This was in my, um, my daily reading the other day. It says, and this is something that might, might kind of make you go, oh, man, come on, you know. It might make you, I say that because it did make me. <laughs> you know? But in 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 12, it says, Live such good lives among the pagans. So in the world, live such good lives that they, accuse, um, that they accuse you of doing wrong. They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. God is going, He is coming back. He is returning, right? They, we want to live in such a way that everybody looks at us and sees our good works. It says, submit yourselves to the, um, for the Lord's sake to every human authority. That's that. Er, what? To every human authority, whether to the emperor or the president, as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. You know, if you're doing good, there's going to be foolish people that have ig ignorant talk uh, against you. That's what she's talking about with the comments and stuff. But it says, For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the in uh, ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. It even goes on and talks about slaves honoring their masters, even if they're not good masters, even if they're brutal to you. He says, because if, if they just, if they honor you and you get beat for doing, and you're doing something wrong and you get beat for doing wrong, what honor is that? You know, but if, if you get beat for doing what's right, then God's going to step in. God's going to honor you and you give him an opportunity to lift you up. So the last example that we wanted to touch on that we feel like is, is an example of Jesus' reconciliation, how he reconciled us to God, is the body of Christ. And it's the body of Christ to the world. And so this is just, I mean, it touches everything. So whether you might not be married, maybe you're not a parent, maybe you don't have any friends, like we still have the opportunity to be an example of reconciliation. And as the body of Christ, we get to do that within our body of Christ family. So I love Ephesians 1.23. It says, The church is Christ's body, 
the completion of him who himself completes all things everywhere. 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 And that's Ephesians 1.23. And so, you know, we another good scripture, which I'm not going to read it all, is 1 Corinthians 12. 12 through 27, and this is where it it goes into the body of Christ, and it gives the example of the body of Christ as children of God being like a human pot, a human body. You know, there's all different parts, and every part is important. The head, the eyes, the arms, the toes, some parts you can't see. You know, God may have you doing something in his kingdom and for him that nobody sees, you know, you're not, you might not be up here on a stage or something like that, but every part is important is what it, what it talks about. And we need every part, you know, like imagine losing one part of your body. It's going to make things difficult. And so he calls us to honor every part because we're all, we're all of the same we're all cut from the same cloth. You know, it, it says, um, but we have all been baptized in one body by one spirit. And we all share the same spirit. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. And so this is another way we can be an example of reconciliation. I mean, the word says that the world will know us as children of God, as believers in Jesus, by the way we love each other, other believers, by the way we love each other. So if we're being selfish and trying to get ahead and talking about each other behind our backs or worrying about if, if we're better here or better there. Or we don't want them in that position because they, they messed up over here and they don't deserve that, you know. We're not showing the world what it's like to love each other. We're not being that example. And so we get that opportunity. Yeah, I love um, something to think about is, is if we... If we're being self-seeking and self-serving, and if it's all about us, how can that bring forth reconciliation? You know, and, and maybe, you, maybe you think, well, not every area needs reconciled. Well, I, I would beg to differ. I think that there's, there's always areas that can use reconciliation, right? And if we're self-seeking and we're putting ourselves before other people, then we're no different than the world, Right? But Jesus came to set us free from that stuff, literally to rip that out of, our, out of our lives. And so some of the keys of reconciliation, the main keys, are love and forgiveness. Love and forgiveness. So anything that we do outside of love, you can, you can rest assured that that's not going to bring reconciliation. It, the Word says that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that he sent Jesus to us. He loved us that much that he sent Jesus, right? So at first it takes, it takes love. We've got to do everything out of love. But then there's this huge, this huge other part called forgiveness. Has anybody ever had somebody do something against you that required Forgiveness in order to bring healing and restoration? Of course, we all have. We've all had people do things to us that in order for reconciliation, we had to forgive. But guess what? We've all done something to other people that have required them to forgive us in order to bring reconciliation. It's easy for us to fix our eyes on what other people have done against us. You know, we want them to forgive us very quickly, don't we? Yeah. But we want them to forgive us quickly, but are we willing to, to pass along the same thing to them? Yeah. I think I've said this before, but I, I had a pastor say this one time, and I just thought it, it was so simple but yet so profound. He said, when we've made mistakes or done wrong, we cry for mercy to God. But when others have wronged us, we cry for justice. 
and we got to cry out for mercy, you know. And I, I wanted to just touch the definition of reconciliation because we're getting ready to wrap up here. But um, there's several different definitions all over the Internet. But one says the process of making two people or groups of people friendly again after they have argued seriously or fought and kept apart from each other or a situation in which this happens. Reconciliation is the end of the estrangement caused by sin between God and humanity. So when we're talking about reconciliation, it's a bringing back. The word talks about it, bringing back together. It's something that was broken, and we're bringing it back together. So that's why we're giving these examples. There is brokenness in marriage everywhere. There is brokenness in parent-child relationships everywhere. There's brokenness in friendships everywhere. And and we get to choose to bring, to come back together, you know, with the Lord's help and grace and love each other and be knitted together in our marriages, friendships, parenting, so that the world can see that there's hope, mm. that there's hope. Yeah. So. And part of that, part of that, it's, you know, it's easy for us to sit here and think about, well, I can forgive my wife, you know, I love her, we can... We can work things out. We can make it happen, you know, um, whatever. It's easy for us to think about forgiving our kids or forgiving, you know, people that we're close to. Sometimes. <laughs> I, I'm talking Go ahead. <laughs> I didn't tag you in yet. <laughs> but Matthew 5, um, 43 through 48 tells us to love our enemies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To love our enemies. What do we gain if, if we as Christians, if we just love people that are easy to love? Mm-hmm. The Jesus world even us, does that. What? The world even can do that. The world does that, right. It doesn't, that's not difficult. But Jesus gave us this great example as he's literally hanging on a cross, literally being tortured, tormented, has his flesh ripped off, right? His guts hanging out. He's nailed to a, a wooden cross with a crown of thorns on it says all this stuff like I don't know I don't think that we could get any worse enemies than somebody that's doing that to you you're literally moments away from dying from what they're doing and Jesus looks down and says to the one person to the one person that can do anything about it Jesus could have literally called down legions of angels and wiped everybody out. Everybody that ever said a bad thing against him. Everybody that spit on him and ripped his beard out. Everybody that was beating him and, and all this stuff. He could have wiped them out. With one word, he could have wiped them out. Honestly, he probably didn't even need to speak it. He could have thought it. And they would have been done. But Jesus wanted us to have the example where he looks down with mercy, love, compassion, tenderness toward the people that are killing him and says, Father, forgive them. He's asking the Father to forgive them because imagine if somebody's doing this to your children, to your child. Somebody's murdering your child, putting them on the cross, right? If somebody's hurting my children and my child says, Dad, get them. They're done. They're done. I can guarantee you they're done, right? Jesus is asking the Father, Dad, Please forgive them. Dad, please have mercy. Dad, don't wipe them out. This is why I came. So that they can be reconciled back to you. We knew this was going to happen, Dad. Please don't take that out on me. I don't know what would have happened to them if Jesus didn't ask. I don't know. You know? God is a just God. But God loved us so much, even the people that were putting him on the cross, that he went through it. He bore it. He knew. God knew. The Father knew. Jesus knew that he would be born into this this manger, born into a stable with all these animals, dirt, filth, all that stuff. He would live just this, this... Basic, simple life. He wouldn't. He went from glory to this. He knew he was going to do all that. And even when all these plans were being put in place, Jesus was with the Father. The Holy Spirit was with them. 
They knew that one day Jesus would be tortured, tormented, and murdered in the way that he was murdered. That's why he said in the garden, if there's any way to take this from me, please take it. But if not, I remember the conversations we had, and may your will be done. He knew before he even came as the baby, this was going to happen. Yeah. And he willingly did it. Yeah, he chose. He chose us. He said, you're worth it. You're worth it. All of us. And that is the greatest gift of Christmas, mm -hmm. that he said, you're worth it. It's the greatest gift that we can receive. And so um, to close out this morning, we want to bring it all back to Jesus, the blessing of his reconciliation. Colossians 1, 19 through 22 says, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Isn't that hope? <laughs> Isn't that hope that, that we don't have to do it in our own goodness? Because we never could. We never could. But he did it for us, made us blameless and holy. So when we see God face to face, we're not going to have to feel shame because we're going to be clean. We're, we're already ready clean if you've received Jesus. And that's the blessing of reconciliation. And I want, I want to encourage anyone here that um, maybe needs to be reconciled to God through Jesus. Maybe you haven't accepted Jesus, surrendered your life to him. Because there's a difference. I can believe there's a God all day long, and that doesn't that doesn't mean that I'm free even and that I've demons. received Jesus. Like Nathan said, even the demons believe. They followed Jesus around saying, this is the son of God. <laughs> like, it's not about, yeah, I believe there's a God. It's about receiving the gift. Receiving the gift. It's like, which this doesn't even compare, but it's like somebody writing you a billion-dollar check with your name on it, and you're a billionaire, but unless you deposit it, you're not a billionaire. They can gift it to you until they're blue in the face, but you have to receive it. And he's given the gift already. We get to receive it. And so, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I was going to close this out. I do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what do you mean, do I? I could go on for hours. Anybody read? No. I'm just but hope, hope you guys brought your presents. Because <laughs> we're doing Christmas here, baby. <laughs> We're having a lock-in. We lock the doors. We're having a lock-in. No. Anybody do lock-ins back in the day? No. But uh, no, one, one other thing that I wanted to, to add, you know, like Brittany's talking about, you have to be able to receive it, but you also, God tells us to cast our cares and our burdens onto Him. Mm. Yep. So you have, to, you have to receive that. And, and something that I've, I've, I've heard, I've participated in even, like, is... Um, putting it at the foot of the cross. It's not that there's something wrong with that. You know, Jesus did die on the cross. He, he bore our sin and shame. He took it all. He literally already took it. But we, we say put it at the foot of the cross. But guys, I can't, I can't stress this enough. He's no longer on the cross. Okay? He says, come boldly before the throne of grace. Come boldly before his throne because he's not on the cross anymore. He already took your sin and shame. He wants you to come boldly into the throne room where he actually is as God, as Savior, as the only one that can change everything. Yep. 
Come boldly to Him. Then cast your cares and burdens. You know, He knows that we still have cares. We still have worries. We still have burdens. We still have this stuff because Satan's lying to you. He's, he's whispering in your ear that you're not worthy. You're not good enough. You're, you know, you're, you're all these things. And so we hear that and we think that. Well, He gives us the key to come boldly to the throne room and lay that stuff on. He says, cast it on to me. Take on my cares because my burdens are light. My yoke is light. This plan that I have for you, it's easy. You can take it. I want you to have it. It's yours. This is what you get. I'm taking all of your cares. I'm taking the things that are holding you down and causing you to feel condemnation and guilt and shame and all that stuff. He's like, you, that's not for you. That's not what I have for you. What I have for you is freedom. Yes. What I have for you is mercy, love, kindness, grace, all this stuff. Amen. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm going to, yes. if no. you let me keep going, I'm going <laughs> to it's, it's true, though, and, and I'm so thankful for that, you know, for that mercy and grace and love, and I'm so thankful that even at my worst, I can run to the Father, when I've screwed up over and over, when it's like, oh my gosh, I've asked you to help me not to do this, and I keep doing it. Like, I mean, how many of us can attest to that? There's things in your life that it's like you think you got it handled, and then you keep doing the same stupid things. <laughs> and, but he's so merciful, and, and that's what Jesus did, and that's what we're celebrating, his life and the life he gave us. So to close, I just wanted to encourage you to think about the ways that you can be an example of reconciliation in these areas moving forward. You know, and make a commitment in your heart to the Lord to help you to be that and help you to see it. Sometimes we get, it's like we're in a rat race and we're not hearing him or, or seeing what he's wanting us to do because we're just trucking along and not paying attention, you know? And so I want to pray, close us in prayer for that, just that we can be that example. I want to also pray for his reconciliation in those areas, you know? Maybe you're, you're estranged in your marriage. Maybe, you're, maybe you've been divorced and are remarried and still have wounds and brokenness, you know, from your previous marriage. Or you're under a bunch of shame and condemnation, because you're on your sec you know you're in your second marriage which that's not God's desire for us either you know maybe you have a child that you've screwed up a lot with and they don't want to talk to you you know or they're not serving the Lord and you felt like you did everything right and they don't love Jesus and they're not following God I just want to pray over those relationships this morning and so if you'll just be as I pray if you'll just be asking the Lord just to to bring that reconciliation and healing in those relationships and to help you. And then most importantly, if you, if you haven't received Jesus, as, if you haven't received that gift, you have the opportunity to do that today. And, and there's not some perfect way to do it. <laughs> you simply believe that he is the son of God and that he died to forgive your sins and to wash your sins and say, I, I want you to be in my life. I want you to be in charge of my life and Lord of my life. So I'm going to pray. If you'll bow your heads with me. Lord God, we thank you so much for the gift of reconciliation. We thank you so much for Jesus' birth. We thank you so much for the incredible way you chose to come to earth, the humble way, the way of humility. And Lord God, we just are so grateful for that, Lord. And I just pray this morning that, first off, that you would be the reconciler in our relationships. No matter what relationship it may be, marriage or parenting or friendship or, or work relationships or coworkers, that you would be the reconciler and that we would give you the freedom to bring reconciliation by choosing to love and forgive, just as you did. Those are the keys of reconciliation. Lord God, so I pray over the marriages. I pray over uh, the relationships and the friendships and the parenting, Lord. And I just pray your blessing. I pray your redemption and your restoration and healing and forgiveness and freedom in those relationships, Lord. And we thank you that you loved us so much that we get to partner with you 
to be a light in the world. So help us, Lord, to take those opportunities to be an example of reconciliation in every type of relationship we have, Lord. And Lord God, most of all, we thank you for Jesus and the price he paid. And we receive the gift he's given. And if you haven't received that and you want to, you can just ask him to come and be Lord of your life, Lord. So we ask you, even those of us who have already received your gift, we want to come back to that place and say, Lord, have your way. We believe, we receive you, and we thank you that you are making us a new creation, that you have made us a new creation, Lord. So we just love you, Jesus. We thank you for the season of hope, your hope that doesn't disappoint us, that doesn't shame us, Lord. And we just, we just plan to rejoice in that hope tomorrow. And we thank you for strength as we're with our families to love them as you have loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, real quick, there's two things that, that I'd like to do. Um, one is I'd like to read you some attributes of Jesus, um, of Jesus' love from 1 Corinthians. And this was something that Brittany's brother actually put together. He's a senior pastor over in, uh, in Liberty, kind of North Kansas City area. But um, we were at his church one day, and he passed these out. And I just think that it's so powerful. And think about Jesus. So this this season that we're in, this Christmas season, right, is, is all about Jesus. So I really want us to remember his attributes and, and what he does in us and through us, what he can do. His love. Yeah. His love. It says, Jesus is patient with me and my imperfections. So when I'm saying me and my, you guys take it personal. Hold it for yourself, Okay. Jesus is patient with me and my imperfections. He is active in doing good towards me. Jesus desires me to get ahead. Jesus is self-effacing, yeah. right? Not obstinate. Um, Ostinacious. Why would, why would he use these big words? <laughs> Neil, if you're watching this... <laughs> Jesus came to serve. He doesn't treat me um, arrogantly. He doesn't. Mm -hmm. He truly doesn't. Jesus displays manners, courtesy, and empathy. Jesus isn't irritable, but graceful under pressure. Jesus doesn't keep account of my wrongs. He erases all, um, resentments. all resentments against us. Like, he, he doesn't even start out with resentment. He doesn't resent. Yes, exactly. Jesus doesn't gossip. He aggressively advertises the good in me. Mm, Jesus good. defends and holds me up. Jesus believes the best about me. He never gives up on me, but affirms my future. And Jesus pre uh, preserves and remains loyal to the end. Perseveres and remains loyal to the end. Amen. Think about those things and, and who he is with us and who he wants to be. So since tomorrow is Christmas and what that is is the celebration of his birth, um, would everybody stand with me and, and we'll just sing happy birthday to him? It's <laughs> awesome. He technically wasn't born on December 25th. I know most of you probably already know When that. was he born? But that's okay. It doesn't matter. We're choosing to celebrate him tomorrow. That's right. So we're, we're singing happy birthday to Jesus. We used to do this with our girls when they were little. We'd make a birthday cake and sing happy birthday to Jesus. And we told them that's why they got presents at Christmas, because God loved them so much that he wanted them to have birthday presents on his birthday, <laughs> which is true. <laughs> so. It absolutely is. Okay. And he's our gift. All right. Here we go. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jesus. Happy birthday to you. Woohoo! Right. Well, Merry Christmas, you guys. Merry we love Christmas. you. Thank you for coming, and we pray you have a blessed evening and day tomorrow.